Dear friends, dear colleagues, <clears throat> I'm extremely happy to welcome you today at the launch event of Civic's latest report, Fighting for Our Lives, COVID-19 and the Protection of Civilians in Conflict-Affected States. And, um, and I'm welcoming you here today on behalf of the Center for Civilians in Conflict and uh, the Swiss government who is uh, kindly uh, supporting us with this event and this report. Um, I would like first to thank our host, uh, the Geneva Center for Security Policy, the GCSP, for um, having this event here today in person and online. Uh, we are still in the era more than ever of the hybrid events. <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, thanking also the technical team for the, the wonderful work that they are doing uh, organizing this hybrid uh, event. I would like also to um, send the apologies of, um, of Mr. Vesner, the head of security and law at the GCSP, who, who unfortunately won't be able to be with us today. Um, he got tested positive to COVID-19, so it's uh, definitely a, a very timely um, conversation. And so we wish him uh, the, the, all the best for, for recovery. And we are also uh, grateful to GCSP, actually, in between brackets, uh, for the fact that Civic has won the second place at the GCSP Innovation Prize just last week uh, on uh, our work, uh, innovative work on creating civilian harm tracking mechanisms uh, uh, with or in support to uh, security and defense forces across the globe, and especially in, 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 in the Sahel and in Ukraine. So we're, it's a really nice perspective to be engaging with the Geneva community on better practices and policies adaptive programming, innovative ways to look at how we can better protect civilians in conflict. Um, and of course, uh, switching to the topic of the day, I would like to thank you all in this room and uh, present also in our virtual room. Um, because I think we had we have a lot of people who have signed up for this event who are online today, and um, from our offices in Geneva, in other capitals, we have people signed up uh, from Nigeria, Ukraine, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, um, Brussels, Geneva, as I mentioned, and many other places, which I think demonstrates the importance uh, for field humanitarian and protection actors. Uh, to better understand the threats to civilians uh, that um, uh, this new um, era, actually, this new pattern of having COVID as part of our working environment and part of the protective environments of civilians has uh, created. Um, and um, I will let, of course, our dear speakers and, and Emily Knowles, the author of our report, tell you everything about uh, the research. Uh, and she will do it in a much more eloquent way than I would. Um, but maybe let's, let me get back on the question of the why. Why Civic decided to explore the question of the relationship between the COVID-19 pandemic and the protection of civilians? Um, how did we define this research and how did we get to the findings that we get to? And, um, and actually, I'd like to get back to the early days of the pandemic. Um, we are now nearly two, two years down the line. Uh, back in May 2020, when uh, some of us uh, indeed um, what started to process the impact of COVID-19 on the civilian population, the communities, on the potential protection challenges that we would create, as well as our, our own challenges in being protect and, uh, protection actors being deployed on the ground. And, um, and across the world, we would see um, security and defense forces deployed in Western countries, in fragile states, in conflict-affected countries. Uh, and they were deployed to support the enforcement of restricted measures. Uh, they were deployed also in some instances to support the medical response um, that was being delivered. Um, but across the globe, we had actually, I think since a long time, never seen so many people in uniform being deployed in the streets, alongside with civilians, with civilian agencies and with uh, communities. So for some of us, and that was the case actually for me, and I, I'm sure for, for a lot of you uh, in, in, in this uh, physical and virtual room, it um, brought us back to uh, previous large-scale outbreak responses. For instance, the West uh, Africa Ebola outbreak in 2014-2015, uh, other um, large-scale outbreak response, um, cholera in Yemen uh, a few years later, and uh, trying to see, okay, in the very situation of COVID, what would be the impact on uh, protection of civilians and, and on our protection activities on having uh, so many people in uniforms mobilized and deployed. Uh, some of the questions that we were asking ourselves, for instance, was how to mitigate the risks uh, arising from the use of security and defense forces to undertake tasks that they have not been necessarily properly trained and equipped to do. Uh, 
um, also how has the pandemic more largely affected conflict dynamics and, uh, and therefore the protective environments of civilians, if, if it has? Um, and while security forces, public health sectors and c civil society were uh, being deployed alongside, uh, let's say, or in interaction together in this, uh, in this response, um, what civil military challenges would it potentially raise? Um, another question was also in relation to, to the international mission and international community. How would international missions deployed in conflict countries, whether they directly contribute to deliver protection activities, for instance, monitoring, um, or whether they largely con more largely contribute to stability, for instance, for uh, that's the case for the international military mission for some of them. How would COVID-19 affect their capacity to play this role and to deliver these activities? Um, so, uh, very much uh, the, the report uh, um, written by Emily and, and her findings very much look at how these threats have materialized. And I will just share um, two main findings or takeaways from my side before handing over to, to Anne and the panel. Um, um, I think what was very interesting from this research, you know, when you have initial intuitions and initial questions, is whether the research is going to confirm or infirm these questions. And what I found extremely interesting that some of the findings do con did confirm some of our initial intuitions, but also some of them infirm them. And, and the first one was about this, um, you know, initial question that we had on, <coughs> sorry, on the potential double threat, COVID and war, that uh, the, the, the people were going to face. And, uh, and what uh, Emily found was that they, there was a threat, but uh, the, the answer is much more nuanced than this. Uh, it was conflict specific, uh, there were differences of magnitude, so it was uh, global but not universal. And the second uh, really interesting uh, finding for me was uh, in terms of the civil military challenges. Um, we had two, two interesting points. The first one was, uh, first, it w we had to look at this uh, civil military question really at large, because uh, what we saw was uh, that those uh, people in uniforms that were deployed were mainly local security uh, units. So let's say police, gendarmerie, public uh, policy order units, and, and therefore not so much although they were in some instances uh, the military, uh, national or international ones. So it calls for different sort of, uh, uh, let's say, civil military challenges in, in a large sense. Um, and, uh, and having local um, security forces uh, on the ground deployed, uh, it was the same actually for the protection actors. Solutions were found by local protection actors. So I think uh, what uh, we very much um, found and are really happy to discuss with all of you today is the fact that for now what we found are good practices developed by local actors, so locally owned, developed, and implemented practices. And I think all of us um, here and in all the different places we're located should really strive to promote and to support the implementation of those practices. Um, so with this uh, first uh, intro words, I'll hand over to our fantastic um, moderator, Anderit Maten Patinomaya from the Swiss Mission in Geneva. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much, Beatrice. No pressure when you say fantastic moderator. Now I have to live up, up to the task. <laughs> Good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure for colleagues who are in the room. I have to say it's find it wonderful to be able to be again in the room. Let's hope that lasts. And of course, a warm thank you to our audience online. So we, we Switzerland, are absolutely delighted to be co-organizing the launch of this policy brief together with Civic, long-standing partner of ours. Um, I'm also personally delighted to be moderating the conversation that we're going to have, which I think is going to be absolutely very enlightening and quite fascinating. We have four distinguished panelists with us. They're online. I will introduce them as soon as I give them the floor. It's also an opportunity for me to really warmly thank them. Thank you for being, you know, available uh, for this conversation with us. As Beatrice um, alluded in her opening remarks, we want this panel discussion indeed to go a bit more into the details of the policy brief, but we also have the great privilege of having colleagues who will offer more, 
contextualize national perspective from specific countries of indeed this challenge of maintaining this protection agenda while having to operate in a context which is affected by, by COVID. So we really look very much forward to, to hear from them. Um, the flow that we have foreseen is roughly 45 minutes for the four panelists that we have. And then of course, we will open it to questions and answers. Um, for our colleagues online, I think you all knew the drill, but for you know the good process of the conversation, I'll still go through some housekeeping rules. Very grateful if you could keep your microphones off while our panelists are speaking. Maxence, I would imagine it's better also if they don't have their cameras. I think it's better for the quality of the sound. And of course, as soon as we open it to questions and answers, please raise your hands virtually for those who are online and for our colleagues who are in the room please <laughs> just like the good old days raise raise your hand and we'll be very happy to to hand over the the floor and with that i think we will turn it to our first speaker emily knowles so emily knowles is a senior researcher at civic in her presentations, she will indeed um, uncover some of the main areas of research of the policy brief. She will also share some of the findings of the policy brief, the methodology. Um, and of course, very importantly, she will conclude by putting forward some main recommendations. So with that, Emily, you have the floor. And thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you so much, everybody. And I hope you can see my slides. Uh, two years into the pandemic, I'm still trying to work out how to use Zoom, um, but hopefully they're showing up uh, now. And I just wanted to extend really my, my thanks to everyone for being here for the launch of this report. A huge thank you as well to my excellent co-panelists and thank you to the many people as well who've given up their time and shared their knowledge with us for this research. I also wanted to extend special thanks to civics country teams in Ukraine, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, who generously allowed us access to key personnel, project documents, and examples of best practices from their own work during what has been an extremely challenging time. And honestly, without their commitment to the protection of civilians throughout the pandemic and during periods of high levels of violence and conflict in their countries, this report wouldn't have been possible. And of course, many thanks as well to the Swiss Confederation for supporting Civics Europe program and making this research and report possible. Uh, this is really a report on, on the impact of what is uh, an emerging crisis, um, a COVID-19 pandemic. And I think, you know, we're all at this point now where we've had two years of COVID-19 uh, and there'll be plenty of COVID-19 to follow. Um, but we're still grappling with, you know, recurrent waves of infections, uh, shuttered businesses. And I think what was really interesting for us is, I mean, civics activities obviously have had to adapt and change to match this new reality. Um, trying to balance the need to protect populations from harm while trying to also protect our staff and our stakeholders from the threat of infection. So I'm therefore extremely grateful that the management team chose to sit down and evaluate the impact of COVID-19 on protection activities, giving us all the opportunity to reflect on our lessons learned and examples of good practice that will be useful both as COVID rolls on, but also for the myriad other situations we find ourselves in as a community where our face-to-face -face contact with conflict-affected populations and armed actors is restricted whether that's due to poor security, remote ter terrain, uh, limited international presence, and other such challenges. Next slide, please. So in this report, um, Civic examines both the direct and the indirect impacts of the pandemic on the protection of civilians by security forces and other armed actors, largely through the eyes of the civilian, military, and police practitioners who've worked throughout the pandemic. And our analysis in the report is split into two sections, dealing first with the drivers of civilian harm directly linked to COVID-19, um, and especially the pandemic response by security forces and armed groups. The second section deals more with the indirect impacts of COVID-19 as the pandemic disrupted ongoing efforts to ensure the protection of civilians by civil society, international organizations, security forces, and other armed actors in conflict affected contexts. So the research for this report relied on a blend of desk-based research, literature reviews, and participation in conferences and debates. Um, but in addition, in, in order to complement the information that we could establish from open sources, we conducted a number of qualitative interviews with members of civil society, um, international organizations, militaries, police forces working in conflict affected contexts during COVID-19, where we asked interviewees really to reflect on their own experiences during the pandemic, including how it had affected relationships between security forces and civilians in their contexts, and whether there were ways in which they had adapted their work that had a positive result for the protection of civilians under pandemic conditions. So the examples of good practice in this report are drawn from these discussions, 
um, with some organizations preferring to remain anonymous and some agreeing to but as some of our panelists here today are here to talk about their best practices and lessons learned, I won't steal their thunder in this opening presentation. Um, instead, I'll focus on the top lines of analysis and key recommendations. And I would encourage you to listen to the panel and to read the report for more examples of innovative programming that I hope will encourage us all. So from the outset, I think the rapid spread of COVID-19 across the world, as, as Beatrice mentioned, I mean, it elicited genuine fears of a potential double threat of a severe health crisis coupled with an increase in violence for civilians living in fragile and conflict affected states. However, I mean, at the time of publication, at least, uh, fears of du double threat have not actualized, um, despite the fact that early efforts by the United Nations to establish a global ceasefire to allow countries to focus on tackling the pandemic didn't succeed. Um, the spread of the virus across countries already weakened by war or recent conflict has not yet been a trigger for new political crises. So according to ACLED data, which I hope you have on the, the screens now, um, global levels of violence against civilians actually remained broadly steady between 2019 and 2020, the first year of the pandemic. That being said, um, while there's been no universal experience across fragile and conflict affected states, the pandemic has created opportunities for greater civilian harm in some contexts and exacerbated existing violence against civilians in others. So I know lots of news stories and reports written in the early stages of the pandemic focused on the fact that police and militaries in some contexts committed serious rights abuses while enforcing lockdowns and curfews. Um, and then moreover, as the economic impact of COVID-19 has hit fragile states economies, vital aid and assistance to communities in conflict affected areas have sometimes been redirected both by armed groups and governments keen to support their own constituencies. And some armed groups were able to capitalize on this food and job insecurity as well and the closure of support services to recruit children and other vulnerable populations in greater numbers. In addition to this sort of direct impact of COVID-19 on civilian harm in some contexts, there's also been indirect harm caused by the disruption and suspension of existing protection activities and programs, even as levels of violence have remained high in many conflict affected countries. So, for example, hospitals and medical facilities have continued to come under attack by armed actors during the pandemic, um, multiplying the risks to civilians seeking access to health care during a critical period. Furthermore, many international military and civilian missions, which are involved in a range of protection activities, I mean, if you think including civilian casualty tracking, uh, training for security forces, including militaries and police, um, and providing that sort of strategic level of advice to ministries of defense, ministries of interior, and civilian leaders in conflict prone contexts. Many of these were forced to adjust planned activities or reduce their footprint or suspend and restrict their engagement with local partners altogether. So I think one of the key findings from this report has been really that locally led solutions and community based protection have proved to be an essential lifeline, especially as other protection activities have been adapted, scaled back or put on hold. Um, in areas where community protection networks to well developed, they have really continued in many in many contexts to provide uh, essential essential um, services to the local population. Um, but obviously, unfortunately, in areas where they were less well developed, this has been more of a challenge, and some uh, networks have had to put their activities on hold until greater uh, partner support can resume. So now onto the key findings, part two. I mean, as we've sort of alluded to, the COVID-19 pandemic has not had a universal impact um, on the protection of civilians across fragile and conflict affected states. But instead, of civilian harm has been very context driven and has varied between different countries and different populations. And I think this key finding is really that, you know, at a subnational level, specific groups have experienced the pandemic differently to their peers with the risks of harm proving to be intersectional, meaning that the impact was particularly hard on women, children, displaced populations, refugees, returnees, and other minorities, with the highest risks sitting um, among those who fall across multiple categories. So for example, in Myanmar, uh, local civil society organizations reported um, increased pressures on already traumatized communities, and specifically women and girls who live within IDP camps, linked to an increased security presence, um, in Nigeria as well, participants in a study on the gendered impact of COVID-19 linked to the increased security presence of security personnel to heightened insecurity for women and girls, um, citing specific examples of police brutality and harassment against women by forces implementing lockdowns in their neighborhoods. And some particularly egregious acts of civilian harm appear to have been perpetrated by groups or individuals who capitalized on the pandemic to step up harm against political opponents, 
protesters um, and minorities and sexual minorities and sex workers have been singled out in a number of countries for arrest and abuse by some security forces enforcing lockdowns while IDPs and refugees in some places also face targeted restrictions that were not applied to the general population. Um, so restrictions on people's movement and livelihoods have been identified as also a potential factor leading to recruitment and radicalization, uh, including in Afghanistan before, before the Taliban takeover, organizations had already begun to raise specific concerns that the un increase in unemployment and poverty had made children more vulnerable to recruitment and use by parties to the conflict. In Tunisia, two female returnees from ISIS-controlled areas found their access to reintegration centers and services suddenly cut off during the pandemic. So I think it's safe to say that, you know, whether in Iraq, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Yemen, Somalia, Myanmar, some of these local organizations, especially those run by women, run by minorities, they've been providing key frontline responses to the pandemic, um, but many have faced challenging funding cuts, movement restrictions, um, which have really sort of, you know, challenged their ability to, to provide effective protection within their communities. And we saw stay at home orders, especially during the pandemic, reversing key gains in female independence, including restricting women's ability to engage in protection activities. And what was interesting in the interviews was that this reversal really has held through whether women are working as local community organizers or staff for international missions. So one interviewee working for an international mission um, highlighted the fact that, you know, local female staff were often the first to be asked to work from home during the pandemic as security managers had a tendency to perceive them as more vulnerable than their male counterparts. However, once working from home, women were often expected to do their jobs alongside becoming or being the primary caregiver for their families, an expectation not faced um, universally by their male colleagues who are less likely to have these additional demands placed on them while working remotely. So I think one of the key takeaways from this report is while women's networks and minority led networks are often at the forefront of protection activities and services in their local communities, their activities during the pandemic have been hampered um, by a number of factors, including government initiated COVID-19 restrictions that didn't count them as essential. So I think moving on to recommendations, um, one of the things, and as, as Beatrice alluded to this morning, is that local security forces, a huge range of local security forces, whether police, gendarme, military, border forces, have been and are likely to remain among the frontline responders during health crises uh, and emergencies in fragile and conflict affected states. And they'll also continue to play an important role throughout you know, subsequent waves of COVID-19. So ensuring that these security forces are able to prevent and mitigate civilian harm while enforcing public health measures should be a priority, both for ministries of defense and ministries of the interior, as well as for police and military leadership going forwards. And the international community, of course, that supports these forces, making sure that um, protection of civilians training and civilian harm mitigation training is, is offered to a wider range of forces who are likely to be involved in this sort of frontline effort in the future. So having these structures in place to ensure that everyone understands their obligations, whether you're a member of the border force, the National Guard, um, the military, a police force, making sure that people know you know, how to maintain strong relationships with local communities and their obligations to protect civilians, um, making sure that we're engaging collectively among governments, legislators and civil society actors to create a culture of, uh, of protection and crucially making sure that those actors are well equipped to hold perpetrators of civilian harm to account is also going to be really crucial um, as the COVID-19 crisis continues and as we prepare for future health crises, as is investing in gender sensitive policing training um, to ensure that members of security forces are also involved in all stages of pandemic response planning and implementation. And I think perhaps most importantly, it's going to be incorporating these lessons learned from policing this um, first two years of the COVID-19 pandemic um, to make sure that, you know, countries' experiences are really uh, integrated back into training in terms of concrete scenarios, what has gone well, what has not gone well, um, so that we can capitalize on lessons learned and good practices um, to put that into place into more training for security forces writ large for the next, uh, for the next health crisis. For civil society and donors, I think, you know, one of the biggest things that we've seen is this fact that developing local resilience and protection capacity really is the best way to build preparedness for the next health crisis. Um, so making sure uh, that you've, you've got, you know, these community local resilience and protection capacity uh, is really essential. I mean, they're essential during pandemics, but they're also essential in other settings where it's hard for external organizations to get face-to-face -face access to communities. So making sure that we're 
you know, assessing disproportionate impact of major health crises and other emergencies on vulnerable populations and equipping local networks to work with these to sort of confront these barriers um, is going to be really important, but also making sure that we're starting conversations with funders early about, you know, how to uh, change uh, and adapt programming at short notice. Uh, to make sure that you know local local organisations don't uh, don't see sort of discontinuity in support and can deal um, and can build these kind of adaptations to deal with worst case scenarios into their planning so that they can pivot sort of easily to respond to to changing local needs. For international uh, for the international community, it's been a huge challenge, I think. And I mean, having to withdraw international staff from important protection and advisory roles at short notice will always be disruptive. Um, but ensuring that civilian and international civilian and military missions alike uh, have the plans and processes in place to allow protection advisors to stay uh, and to communicate um, with their local partners is going to be a real priority, I think, for headquarters and mission staff going forwards. One thing that we saw was that protection staff, civil military liaison aren't always you know, categorized as essential and therefore are liable to be withdrawn during a crisis, whereas, you know, making sure that we have ways to make sure that there's a, at least a limited presence of protection staff maintained in country during an emergency um, could be one of the ways that we improve responses going forwards, including ensuring that strategic communications plans are in place and are shared between international partners. I think communicating with the local community, communicating with the local partners about why um, support is being withdrawn or paused or changed is going to be really important, as well as building more room into mission mandates to adapt and react. Uh, flexibly to significant changes in the situation on the ground. Some of the most sort of successful examples that we've seen and that we highlighted in the report were organizations that were able to find that flexibility within their mandates to pivot support to community-based protection projects or projects run by women's associations um, at short notice if a crisis hit. And of course, part of that is that understanding and planning for the disproportionate impact of pandemics and other crises on vulnerable populations to make Make sure that there are plans in place to make sure that they're not left behind um, in the case of future health crises. So I think I will wrap it up there. I think while we'll say that the COVID-19 impact has not had a universal impact on the protection of civilians in fragile and conflict affected states, it has nonetheless increased the risk of civilian harm, both directly and indirectly in specific contexts. And I think, you know, after such an unprecedented global experiment in pandemic policing, um, stay at home orders and virtual work environments, it is really crucial now to start learning those lessons and adapting programming to ensure that civilians are better protected as we continue to live under COVID-19, but also as we prepare for the next potential crisis. I mean, in some states, uh, these violent crackdowns against civilians in the name of the pandemic enforcement are likely to have long-term effects on civil military relationships and levels of trust between populations and the security forces who are there to protect them. In others, it may also take a long time for funding for crucial protection services for vulnerable populations to re regain pre-pandemic levels, an issue with the potential to compound the already disproportionate impact of the pandemic on the protection of women, children, IDPs, returnees, minorities. International organizations, local security forces and NGOs will each need to find a way to redress this imbalance um, and ensure that the protection of civilians and civil military relationships are built back stronger after the pandemic. But I think I will leave it there. I'll leave it to the rest of my panelists to give us some of the examples that they've seen um, throughout the pandemic. But thank you once again uh, for inviting me to this wonderful launch event. And I'm really pleased to be with you. Emily, thank you so much. And maybe just to, to mention that you're actually speaking from Mali. So this is the wonders of, of the virtual connectivity, but also explains why we didn't have the, the privilege of seeing you online. Um, Emily, just a very, very quick follow-up question, um, because I know that we have three uh, fantastic panelists waiting, but I feel this this is, is really critical. As you mentioned, there's quite a, a lot of evidence-based lessons learned coming out of this policy brief, which touched actually a number of different audiences, but it was fascinating to, to hear you also from a more prevention perspective, what we could do better now in the training of security forces. Just quickly, Emily, could you tell us these lessons learned, how will yourself, will Civic also really follow them through, that it also reaches the right audiences? Because I feel this is also a critical point in moving this policy brief forward quickly because I feel that's that's an essential key. No, thank you. It's an it's an excellent question, and I, I genuinely think that you know this sort of event and this sort of discussion is really the first step in that. 
there's so much that you can do with, you know, publishing um, research and highlighting lessons learned in written form. But I think this conversation among the actors who are concerned is, is really important. And I think as well, you know, Civic has a huge capacity to adapt its own work in this space. Um, we'll hear a little bit more about how they've been doing that for their protection activities on the ground as well in the panel. But I think it's, it's a case now of just making sure that we adapt um, a lot of this training and, and kind of understanding. We really capitalize on the examples that we've seen throughout the pandemic to make sure that we're raising these with local partners, that we're, you know, building this into protection of civilians training, that we're building this into part of the conversation. Um, and I think, you know, going forwards, it's just, uh, it's going to be important to make sure that we're constantly, you know, reinforcing the good lessons as well as the, uh, the bad examples of how protection has been done during the pandemic, because I know that especially early on, there was quite a, a negative news stream about protection uh, and lockdown enforcement. So I think, you know, making sure that those voices of actors that have actually been doing really good work and innovative programming is going to be a, a good way as well to make sure that other organizations can, can take on board some of these lessons and can adapt their own programming um, to, take it, to take those into account. Emily, great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being with us. I'm sure there's going to be questions also for you later on in the Q&A. Let me maybe move to our second speaker, who is Mujidang Sitgong. Mujidang, it's great to have you with us this morning. Mujidang is the team lead senior manager for Civic in Nigeria. Uh, Mujidang, I understand that this morning you want to maybe to flag a couple of issues from the perspective of Nigeria. One of them, of course, is the critical need of how we maintain lines of communications between civilians and security forces, really to try to mitigate some of those protection concerns. But also, we very much look forward to hear from you some of the great initiatives that you have developed, a lot which are based on community-based approaches. I also think that you initiated a um, a live radio broadcast for civilian protection. So we really look very much forward to, to hear more on that. And without further ado, Mutidan, I hand you over the floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And to all the other members of the panel, and of course, uh, all those who have uh, the opportunity to join this uh, conversation around this brief. I think uh, as I speak today, I'm sure many of us better understand uh, the impact and of course what COVID-19 is all about than we did when most of the uh, study uh, was happening. And of course, uh, the decision for Civic Nigeria to continue to engage even when COVID uh, was ravaging the world was born out of several conversations and agreements and of course disagreements uh, between the civic team members and, of course, even community members. Uh, we are doing that majorly to be sure that uh, we are actually in the best interest of civilians. And most importantly, we did that to ensure that uh, while we continue to do our work around the protection of civilians, we would definitely achieve that. Uh, Emily had also mentioned in the report, uh, when COVID uh, happened, of course, Nigeria, like every other part of the world, had security deployments in a bit to protect people. And of course, in trying to also ensure that the enforcement of most of the COVID regulations at various countries, and it was the same for Nigeria. But on our project, while we were desiring that we would build community capacity to self-protect themselves, and of course, advocate for their protection in Nigeria, it meant we were also engaged in deep field work where we had to travel to different locations to engage communities and of course continue to provide training for both community members and the military uh, in protection of civilians and of course civilian harm mitigation uh, but uh, pre-covid of course we were able to establish uh, what we call community protection committees we we're also able to provide for them training and we had them very functional and they were conducting advocacy they were doing dialogue with the military they were also engaging in uh, what we term uh, civil military activities where they reach out to the military to engage physically and of course discuss these concerns. But of course, when COVID hit, uh, of course, it meant most of the monthly meetings that were designed for these community protection committee members were not going to happen. Of course, restrictions were everywhere. And it also meant these civil military dialogues that were supposed to be avenues for trust and confidence building between communities and the military and in some cases community security forces were no longer going to be happening. 
And even for us as a team, even moving to these deep field locations, majorly through the use of the United Nations uh, humanitarian uh, support services also was impacted. So we couldn't also travel to those deep field locations. And of course, the regular visit by these community protection committees to engage with the uh, regular visit by, uh, to engage with the uh, brigade commanders in most of these deep field locations was also impacted. And basically it meant a lot came to a standstill. And uh, like I said, we had to find a way around that in trying to see how best do we keep this engagement between communities and the military, especially in this case, to continue to discuss and agree on key concerns and of course, try to resolve some of the challenges posed by uh, the, 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 the both COVID and those regular uh, challenges uh, of community uh, protection. And in doing that, I, I think it's very key to highlight that while we continue to engage uh, uh, visually, of course, we started with text messages, two phones, but of course, in the locations where we work, there was also the challenge of services, of uh, internet services, and of course, network providers unable to even service some of these locations. And out of that came the necessity, uh, or it bond the, the necessity that there was a need to continue to engage with these communities. And uh, we worked close, uh, and of course, try to work with community protection committee members on better ways of how we could engage. Uh, Civic initiated uh, these discussions and uh, we arrived at the use of radio. And for us, that became one of the biggest tools that was engaged. So this live radio program meant we partnered with the military radio station and of course, another privately owned radio station. So with the military uh, in the capital city of Nigeria, in Abuja, Civic had uh, an MOU to engage with that radio station. And majorly what we did was to actually transform some of the modules that we had used to be conducting trainings for the military into some episodes of that radio program. So it meant our trainings had to continue via radio. But interestingly, like mentioned, it became an opportunity to actually get firsthand live response from listeners. So majorly those radio stations had the military listening, had community people listening at the level of Abuja, which is Nigeria's capital. But interestingly, while we also did that at the, the deep field level in Medjugorje, in Northeast Nigeria, we also partnered with another radio station owned by the military to continue to engage in terms of discussions around protection issues. I think it became very clear to us that it was quite a tool that reached out uh, on time. I mean, we also got quite a lot of feedback as those radio programs were live. So we could actually hear those concerns that hitherto would have been discussed in community protection meetings and then related back to either the military before we get those uh, responses back. So it became a tool that could give us even uh, a, 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 a real time response to some of those issues. And we could have, uh, of course, listeners also listening in live and responding. Uh, part of that also led to the procurement of radios. So we had to procure some radios and also hand over to community protection committee members, because of course, most of them are internally displaced persons without any access to even a radio. So we procured some radio and shared back to those communities so that they were able to also listen and also provide feedback. Uh, so people could text at some point where they have networked to relay some of the concerns they had. And of course, during the next episode, we had the opportunity for Civic to either lead those discussions or even other callers responding to some of those concerns that has been raised. So for us, I think that became the tool for the delivery of the protection of civilians. But overall, it also became the tool to get feedback from the security forces, from government, from communities, and of course, across a wider range of listeners. Uh, if our protection committee meetings were limited to just 50 members between the security forces and the community protection uh, committees, uh, the radio provided an opportunity to have hundreds of people listening and contributing to that. So at, at the country level, I think we had quite some achievement in terms of the deployment of radio uh, in the discourse around community protection. And of course, uh, it, it, from then till now, I think that has become a tool. So in our current project delivery and design, we've actually included radio as one of the key 
tools for delivery. Yeah, COVID is not yet over. Uh, we are all aware of that. But of course, the lesson from the past is that we have the radio as a very strong tool to continue to deliver on the message of protection of civilians. And I see that beyond civic, I've seen so many organizations trying to actually tap on that to also engage through the radio, television, just to make sure that those messages never stop to reach out to the targeted audience. And uh, for us at Civic, I mean, we it was a huge uh, success and we've really learned from that. And we are seeing the possibilities and we're seeing, and, uh, we're seeing the opportunity that, that has presented. And like I mentioned, it's a very interactive tool. It is live and it has really reached out to, to persons in terms of uh, the protection of civilians. Uh, added to that, I think there's also uh, the question around uh, how and what were the other alternatives. And I mentioned earlier, text messages were working, but of course limited to only where you have service providers. We also had uh, uh, WhatsApp calls, but that was also limited. And, but majorly, I think uh, the radio proved as a very viable and, 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 and effective tool for communicating in the COVID uh, era and now like we are adopting it post COVID now or while COVID is of course less impactful now. I think the radio has become one of the key tools that uh, we see at Civic Nigeria as a point or as a very viable instrument of engaging and promoting the protection of civilians. Mujidan, thank you so much for sharing this, uh, this perspective from Nigeria and how you use, indeed, this new channel of communication. Can I do a quick follow-up question, just because I think it's, it's also an important component of how we use sometimes new tools. We all know that sometimes information uh, coming out of such discussions, uh, because I understand you really used it as a back and forth, some information can sometimes also be a bit delegate, so I understand it also has to be managed with some care to be sure that the tool indeed is a vector to promote messages, but also does not, you know, do no harm, the famous do no harm. So I was wondering, when you started developing um, this tool, especially you, you mentioned radio, but also WhatsApp, could you tell us more about what were some of the mitigating measures that you took to make sure that the information that was shared was actually not going to sometimes maybe backfire on the communities, that it was really meant to protect them at the end? So what kind of monitoring of, of information, if I can say, did you, did you apply? Okay, thank you very much for that. I think basically uh, in every country, there's the basic, I mean, broadcasting codes that of course, if you need to go live on radio or television, you must adhere to, of course, we're very mindful of that. And that was one of the basic uh, guidelines we had to apply. Uh, so we knew things that needed not to be said on air. And of course we understand, and in the opening series or episodes, uh, listeners were also informed around those key basic uh, uh, tenants of broadcasting so that people don't make the regulatory comments or say things that would, of course, uh, cause uh, some friction or become very sensitive uh, to listenership. But beyond that, I think uh, as we also do with our training models, we are very careful and sensitive in terms of issues that need to be discussed or not. And of course, in our approach, that's why we said we purposely targeted uh, military radio stations. And of course, it also meant that over the time, uh, Civic Nigeria has built that very good relationship with the military. Uh, they are very clear in terms of how we are engaging. Uh, they are very sure of what Civic can do or not do. Uh, of course, Civic is very, very, very clear in terms of how it engages with the Nigerian military. So I would say they understand the perspective of Civic that we are working to better promote relationships between the military and the civilians they are often deployed to protect. So I think to a certain level, the military is really confident that what Civic is doing is helping them to also better engage in their, their, their duty of protecting civilians. Otherwise, they are actually deployed to protect civilians anyway in the first case. So that clarity has helped. But in terms of other sensitivities, of course, uh, you could have one or two uh, people calling in and, of course, not discussing the related topic. 
Uh, and at that point, the anchor would be very clear in terms of trying to also mitigate that uh, instantly. And uh, where there's a need to also put off something of, of, of the air. I mean, it's in compliance with the codes of broadcasting that uh, we would have to do that. But uh, I think the experience has been that people were really clear from the beginning in terms of what needed to be said on air. Uh, we concentrated majorly on issues that pertains to civilian protection and what role civilians need to play. And of course, what role the military or other militia groups needed to play to better protect civilians. So we didn't have so many instances where people were uh, deviating from the thematics of our discussions. So doing that has really helped. But like I said, following the country codes of our broadcasting, and of course, setting up this ground through clearly and also letting the listeners understand why we are doing this was part of what helped us in this delivery. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mujinan, for these further clarifications. I now suggest to move to our third speaker, Joseph Stefanelli, who's the head of protection of civilians and child protection at UNAMA. So, Stefan, I think in, in, in your intervention this morning, I think you want to highlight some of the critical challenges you had in monitoring protection activities while, of course, operating in a very uh, highly uh, fragile context, but also some of the good practices that came out of the remote civilian casualty monitoring. So we're very happy to have you with us for this conversation, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Anne, and thank you to um, Emily and, and Civic for doing all this research and the other panelists for sharing their stories. Very interesting to hear what everybody's been dealing with in this environment. Um, I think I'll just really quickly talk about um, the way that we do our civilian protection work in Afghanistan to put it in context for you. And then I'll, I'll, I'm mindful that we're, we're a bit short on time. So I'll try to keep everything very brief and remain under my 10 minutes here. In, in Afghanistan, uh, as the UN Human Rights Office, we've been doing protection of civilians monitoring and reporting for more than 10 years and then trying to systematically document how civilian casualties are caused in order to use that to advocate with the parties. And in doing that work, really what, what something that we had developed over the, all of those years and something that we ended up uh, seeing as really a, a, a factor for allowing us to continue to do our work throughout the COVID pandemic was really uh, the development of networks of people in, from the communities all the way up to the higher levels of the government with whom we were engaged both to receive information and also to you know giving feedback on the um, what was happening let's say you know that the type the way casualties were being caused in communities that we were monitoring so we, we would help people to have a better understanding of what was going on in their own community and use that to do their own advocacy as well as to work with us on doing advocacy at all the different levels. So having those networks and having established them through really long-term you know, monitoring, and, and we also benefit very much from, uh, in a lot of ways, the recognition of this work and the recognition of you know, the UN uh, in doing this work in Afghanistan. We then had people who we had engaged with for many years, and in, in some cases, face-to-face, uh, who had, we interacted with regularly, who were very used to sharing information with us. And so that allowed us to have a really good, um, you know, to, to continue these discussions as needed through phone and WhatsApp and, and, and other different means during the, the pandemic. What's interesting about um, Afghanistan, I would say, is we had, this is actually something that we had always done as a part of our, our work and a part of our monitoring. So. We, because there were areas we couldn't reach regularly or couldn't reach at all, and we would have to, you know, invite people in to see them in person, it was a very regular thing for people to already speak to us and to have some limited conversations over the phone, to share information in both directions on the phone. But of course, I think the thing that we really noticed is that what, what you then lose out on is the intermittent in-person discussions that really supplemented the both the information that we could provide. And I think we also really noticed a big loss um, in terms of the way that we conducted advocacy when it had to be done through, you know, not being able to be done face to face. So, I mean, we conducted advocacy and I'm, I'm going to speak in the past tense here because everything's changed since August and I'll go for about a minute at the end and, and just give a, a couple of seconds of, of discussion about what's happening here now. But 
the way that we did work in the past with all the parties when the main parties of the conflict here were the Taliban, the US led coalition and the Afghan government. We had interactions with all of the three of them on a very regular basis in person in a number of different issues. And we did a lot of tactic based advocacy where we, because we had such good information about what exactly was causing civilian casualties, we were really able to bring to them evidence of exactly what how they were causing harm in what places and, and to try to help them get, you know, change the policies and, and also just change their actions in some immediate circumstances at times as well. And I think, you know, for us, that happened in a way because of these networks we developed over the years, not only with communities, but also with all the different organizations working throughout the country, Civic being one of them. I mean, you know, Civic was one of our most important partners over the years for doing these community-based projects and for interacting with people in those ways. So it's, um, I mean, I think, you know, another thing that probably impacted the way things worked in Afghanistan and our ability to do this and our ability to continue our civilian casualty monitoring for a limited period, at least from through a remote through a remote uh, work environment, was the fact that um, in Afghanistan, what was really limiting us from COVID was more people's restrictions from getting in and out of the country. We had a period of time where the country went into a lockdown, but it wasn't here that long of a period in comparison to some other parts of the world. And what we saw then was the, the impact of our own staff to be able to go out into the communities. That, that was there for a short time, but then some of our staff also, I mean, we also had a lot of compounding factors related to the conflict. So we had staff moving out of certain areas because of danger, you know, dangerous situations in the middle of the pandemic or the later stages as well. So it was, it was a very complicated mixture here, but I think because we also then adapted our ways to working as the whole world has now, as we're doing right now, you know, in any other, a few years ago, you would have had all of us sitting there with you if possible. And so I think having people see and adapt to this situation is really something that worked well here. And because a lot of our staff were forced to be outside the country because, you know, they couldn't move, um, it really also forced them to think through with their teams that were in the country, the ways that everything could be done in, in this kind of situation. But I think um, it's really, you know, the, the main thing that we can say from, from the work that we did uh, that, that allowed us to work the way we did was having established these networks. I can't see how we would have continued to get information or to be able to really do any advocacy having not had that, that there and well established. At the same time, again, I think it's really important that we look at the length of time that you go between talking to people in person, because I think we can say that for the first, you know, let's say the first year of the pandemic, um, we were able to keep things up, maybe, you know, because again, it was only a few months of a real intense lockdown here. And then some of our staff could start seeing their contacts again and things. What's, what's happened now and, and what's happened at other times in history in Afghanistan during, you know, in the past, even during the past 10 years, just during times of really intense conflict or where control changed just in one certain area of the country is people then become very reluctant and, and very unable to speak for various other reasons. And so in some ways, um, I think it's also what's happened, what's been really important to us for, the, the, the pandemic was in some ways really like a, a test for what we're dealing with now because you know then we had a lot of our staff um, in August this year evacuated from the, the you know a lot of staff are evacuated outside the country and many of us are back now and a lot of staff are also relocated within the country and some you know have still not been back home and or and may not be able to go back home to where they, they're originally from and so it's already showing us, you know, we've, we've, we've really been able to use what the pandemic taught us in terms of how to interact with people in this new changing environment. But we're facing even more so now, um, and I think it's to be expected in, in a very uncertain environment with, with a new regime that, you know, everybody is afraid, um, has the reputation of being oppressive and, and, and is concerned about, you know, that, that there will be consequences of speaking out against them. We've now found that it's much more difficult to really get information in the same ways that we did before. And again, now I think that comes down as much to our own staff being unable to be sure that they can be safe in certain areas as it does to people who we used to speak to from communities 
being uncertain about you know what will happen to them if, if they speak to us. And I'll I, I'll, I'll give you the, the one minute update on now to say I think what I can one maybe two things that I will say that are positive um, at the moment here. Of course, since August fifteenth, um, when the Taliban took over, we can say that we really can see far, far fewer civilian casualties. You know, the main, I wouldn't say that the conflict has ended here, but I would say one of the main conflicts in the country really came largely to a, to a close in August. And that allowed us to, to really say, there's, you know, there's no longer hundreds of civilians being killed and injured each day from active armed conflict in all parts of the country. We're, we're really documenting far fewer casualties now. However, I can't say that we're as systematically able to track them as we were before. So, you know, we do know that they're, that the that civilians are, are doing better. And of course, there's many, many other human rights concerns, and I don't want to diminish those. But, you know, from the perspective of the purely casualty tracking side, that's something that, that we really can, can be happy about. Um, at least lives are being saved now from, you know, they're not, the fighting's not happening around them in all parts of the country. And the one other thing is that we, as the, the Human Rights Office, have, um, I think maybe even a bit quicker than at least I personally would have expected. I can't speak for you know for anybody else, and I'm and I'm not here to represent you know the UN and, and talk about Afghanistan in any in, in any way. But it I think we've been able to start restart engagement with now the Taliban, who you know uh, as the de facto authorities, and really uh, to have discussions with them on human rights issues in, in ways that we hadn't really expected to be able to so quickly. And again, I think part of that comes from really the way that we had to interact even with them during the COVID times, because we had a dialogue for years, it was in person and we could only meet and only speak in person in Doha through their political office. And that changed, that had to change during COVID. You know, we started having virtual advocacy meetings and interactions with them, you know, as well as with the other parties. And while it certainly wasn't as effective as it could have been, it kept the relationships and the network going and it meant that now we're in a situation where as you know some of the people we had been working with before have come into positions of authority we're now able to restart those discussions even if we can't see them in person yet and then and we have already actually been able to start meeting in person again but yeah i think that's you know a big a big part of it so i'll stop there and uh looking forward to questions people might have thank you Stefan, thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak to us from Afghanistan and listening to you. Of course, I had quite a number of, of questions uh, coming up to my mind, but I'm also mindful of time. So I hope you don't mind, Stefan, if maybe we, we keep the, those questions and we move uh, to our last but certainly not least speaker, Eileen Moreau, who's the Senior Policy and Advocacy Officer at IGVA. Eileen, I think that in your presentation, of course, you want to come back to a very key feature, uh, which is, of course, how much this pandemic is affecting vulnerable populations. Um, I think that's very important that this is also key in the conversation that we're having this morning. Eileen, it's great to have you with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, I've joined ICFA leading um, our COVID-19 advocacy and rollout of vaccinations. And I'm also supporting ICFA members to improve humanitarian access, which COVID-19 has had a significant impact on. So from speaking to our members, particularly those engaged in our COVID-19 um, working group, and also from my own experiences as country director and forum director in Ethiopia, I wanted to talk to you today about the barriers impacting access to vaccines among conflict affected populations and secondly, give a brief overview of the impact COVID-19 has had on humanitarian organizations' ability to secure humanitarian access. And there's a lot that I've heard today from the earlier speakers that has resonated with me um, in terms of the issues. So first off, in terms of the barriers, um, unequal vaccine access remains the first and most pressing concern. So WHO estimates that there are six times more boosters administered globally than primary doses in low income countries. Um, and unfortunately, while vaccines aren't turning out to be the panacea we'd hope them to be, Without them, we will continue to see higher death rates among the unvaccinated, overburdened health systems in fragile contexts and adaptation of the virus that can avoid you know, vaccines and be more transmissible. I, I don't know if you've heard, but in the last 24 hours, there's been a new variant announced, which is heavily mutated and very concerning. <clears throat> 
So I'm sorry if this is the first you're hearing of it, but it's extremely concerning news. Um, Recently, Oxfam is putting together a briefing note that identified that people affected by conflict are particularly at risk of COVID-19. Um, so refugees and displaced populations are not only more likely to be living in crowded and cramped conditions with poor hygiene facilities, but are also significantly less likely to be able to reach the vaccine or health facilities to access treatment. So the second barrier really is around inclusive planning. It's great to see that the humanitarian buffer has now been able to start providing vaccinations. However, it's so important that the humanitarian buffer remains a measure of last resort and governments include all populations of concern in their national vaccine deployment plans. So UNHCR has reported that at least 153 states have adopted COVID-19 vaccine strategies that include refugees. However, in Uganda, they estimate that less than 1% of refugees are fully vaccinated. And so it's critical that refugees and populations of concern are intentionally included in vaccine rollout and the constraints reach, uh, in reaching them are addressed and planned and budgeted for. Which brings me to the third barrier, which is logistics and providing vaccines in humanitarian settings, particularly in conflict affected contexts, is extremely difficult. Cold chains are hard to manage at the best of times, but traveling down like long damaged roads through hot climates to understaffed health facilities is really hard and it costs a lot of money and care estimates that delivery costs from tarmac to arm for vaccines in um, humanitarian contexts such as South Sudan are six times more expensive than the current global estimate for vaccine delivery. Um, thirdly, in terms of bureaucratic and administrative barriers, um, sorry, fourthly, um, we're seeing that many national and even the UN system for registering staff members for vaccinations requires computer literacy and internet access. And my own experience as country director was that our outreach workers, our cooks, cleaners, security guards, which are really the backbone of humanitarian response infrastructure, found it a real struggle to register and they needed a lot of support. So for refugees who may not speak the language, have no internet access, have concerns about how their data is going to be used, are, are being asked for identification cards, this is particularly off-putting. And there's a real fear that they could be arrested when they attend for vaccines. So governments really need to identify and remove any perceived barriers to vaccine access. The fifth barrier is vaccine hesitancy and vaccine hesitancy is often used as a catch all term for everything that puts people off getting a vaccine. But it's really important that the logistical and systematic barriers reducing uptake of, uh, of vaccines are not conflated and lumped together with personal concerns and misinformation about the vaccine as this can lead to mistaken beliefs about the population, blame individuals rather than the systems that are responsible for uptake and ultimately undermine an effective response. So a person might not want to get a vaccine because they're too scared to leave their homes in an active conflict or the vaccine site is far away and expensive to get to. And this requires an entirely different response than misconceptions about vaccine safety and of course the vast misinformation online campaigns. Um, so despite very strong reporting on anti-vaxxers that we see, the RCC collective notes that global vaccine acceptance is almost 90%, and it's actually on an upward trend, even in the United States, albeit slowly. So there are large data gaps in low income and conflict affected con contexts on vaccine acceptance. But even countries like Iraq that had vaccine acceptance rates less than 40% a few months ago are now over 83%. So it's really positive and going in the right direction. So it's critical we don't make assumptions about vaccine acceptance and take time to understand and address the specific concerns that populations have. Um, Fifth is really around the low prioritization of COVID-19 in a lot of these conflict affected contexts. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it, and, and in fairness, you know, there are more pressing concerns in, in, in a conflict. It's very worrying where you're going to get your next meal, where you're going to access um, maternity services. Um, so, you know, and there's there's other disease outbreaks still ongoing. So when Intersos was providing COVID-19 vaccinations in Nigeria, a measles epidemic broke out. Unfortunately, they were able to respond to both. 
But in many contexts, essential services have been crippled. And the World Health Organization estimates that 22 million infants didn't get their measles vaccine last year, which is 3 million um, less than the previous years. So we really need better investment in health systems. Um, it's been really hard to build trust. And that's a theme I'm hearing from, from Joseph as well. And, and um, it's just been so hard to overcome suspicions because of the adaptations that we've all had to make to stop the pandemic. And I know that humanitarian NGOs have bent over backwards to adapt and keep their staff safe and essential services running. So now for the second part, I wanted to discuss some of the challenges that NGOs have experienced to providing services and gaining access to conflict affected populations in, in COVID-19 times. So the first issue really is the impact on humanitarian space and access. COVID restrictions and of course our duty of care measures have reduced our capacity to provide surge staff. And as Muji Dang flagged, it really reduces ensuring protection by presence. It's made coordination difficult, particularly in um, the protection clusters. It's undermined shared analysis and open conversations, which as Joseph highlighted as well, has really undermined collective advocacy. It's just eroded trust so much. And NGOs in restrictive contexts like Ethiopia, they are self-censoring because all associations can be traced, conversations can be recorded and shared with governments, with journalists and parties to the conflict. And we also have seen reductions in humanitarian diplomacy and international mediation. Embassies have reduced staffing levels. It's made casual meetings with government and the diplomatic community harder to organize. And it's reduced chance encounters at events, which are all key to building trust and mutual understanding and solidarity. And I absolutely agree with Emily's recommendation to designate civil mill personnel as essential staff, because without humanitarian access, there is no humanitarian response. So COVID-19 has also made humanitarians work more dangerous. Communities are suspicious of staff you know, wearing masks. Um, they think you might have COVID-19. So one staff member in car told me that they avoided wearing masks on the streets because of this type of suspicion. I've seen the same in Ethiopia, where people react very differently to you when you were wearing a mask and accuse you of having the virus. So even before COVID-19, humanitarian health workers have faced considerable risks and we're seeing an increase in, in attacks and killings of humanitarian uh, workers. So it's protecting um, the safety, health and well-being of humanitarians should be a key global priority. In terms of duty of care, the difficulties facing humanitarian workers are exasper exacerbated by the inequitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. And, and many humanitarian staff face higher risks of infection from COVID-19. I want to flag that the UN vaccination program is up and running and has 600,000 vaccinations for humanitarian staff, both international and national staff. So do get in touch with your uh, UN country team if your field staff are still to be vaccinated. It's, you know, humanitarian staff are vaccine ambassadors and it's critical that we do no harm. Um, in terms of localization, COVID-19 has brought a, a major acceleration in localization, which is fantastic, but it's important to note that the specific risks facing local organizations in conflict affected contexts are understood. There is too much of a practice of donors and UN and even INGOs to transfer risk onto local organizations and they are least able to manage these risks. Um, in terms of humanitarian financing, donors have increased humanitarian and COVID-19 funding. However, the needs mainly caused by the secondary impacts of COVID are far outstripping the gains and continue to grow. And many NGOs haven't necessarily seen a growth in funding um, and have been forced to reduce their services. There was extremely little response to the second Haiti earthquake, for example. Um, NGOs are doing more with less. They're pivoting funding from existing programs to address COVID-19 and its secondary impacts. But this will have long-term impacts on, on essential services and, unless further funding is brought on board. Um, it's been a really tough 19 months. Um, I don't know yet, yesterday's news 
about this new variant is just so disappointing. I know we're all so tired with COVID. It's really hard to be positive, but to be honest, there's actually so much to be positive about. The COVID-19 response uh, from a coordination, innovation, technical and people power perspective has been incredible. Yes, there's been major injustices and short-sighted self-interest, but there's been more people doing incredible things to save lives and continue providing services to the most vulnerable. So really just to echo some of the points from the earlier speakers, we need to keep building trust keep reaching out and openly communicating with each other, ensuring that the voices and interests of people who are most impacted by the pandemic are at the center of planning and response. It's clear to me that we're fighting a global war against this virus, but only a fraction of the world's population is properly equipped. And we need to change the systems for responding and build a better world to overcome this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eileen, and thank you so much for bringing back into this conversation this critical aspect of ensuring safe and equitable access uh, to vaccines for, for all. I think this is also, of course, a very important feature of the conversation that we're having this morning. Uh, we have colleagues roughly 15 minutes uh, ahead of us now for the questions and answers. I would uh, first like to open it to our participants in the room to see if there are some initial reactions, some questions. Very happy to collect maybe some views. Yes, perfect. All right, thank you so much. My name is Annika Hilding Norberg. I'm head of peace operations, peace building here at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. First of all, I'd like to thank you so much for this uh, really interesting, informative, uh, and I would say, uh, despite the topic, inspiring <laughs> presentation of findings. Um, uh, I'm coming to the issue from the peace operations uh, perspective, and of course, protection of civilians being one of the core two uh, responsibilities of peace operations nowadays. Um, it would be interesting to see to what extent, if you, in your work on developing uh, your understandings of the issues during the report, um, what your view is on, on the one hand, we have to build resilience and take a comprehensive approach, of course, but to what extent specific uh, missions, if we take the examples of Anmir in Ebola, uh, in Liberia, where you had a dedicated mission to do this, and of course at the time it was seen as very innovative and pioneering and you know, pandemic peacekeepers, if you like, but the record of it has been fairly... Uh, uh, you know, broadly debated to what extent that was useful or not and what we can learn from it. And just in the last couple of days, uh, there's been a workshop looking at uh, pandemics and, and peacekeeping operations. And both Karin Langren and uh, David Gressley uh, came to the uh, findings that this was not a, a, a process or an initiative uh, that should be pursued. Uh, is there an understanding of to what extent are those kind of specified uh, initiatives that's helpful or not in the kind of in the in the dealing with COVID and other kind of coming issues as we talked about it would probably not be the last one unfortunately thank you absolutely I suggest maybe to cluster a couple of questions just looking at the audience to see oh yes please hi hello well thank you for the invitations I am Mohammed from Yemen uh, head of the humanitarian affairs in the permanent mission of uh, Yemen to the UN here. Um, well, it's thank you for the presentations and, th and thank you for the panelists. Uh, we have in the Yemen, as she mentioned, that uh, we um, in the war to, to, to we have just war and the pandemic, and we have also a humanitarian uh, what is it, a crisis. Thanks. Oh, thanks. And the other, uh, the other diseases uh, was to, such as the, was the cholera. So we have also the IDBs. Uh, we it's more than four millions to, to, to because of the of the war just imposed by the Houthi militias, and half of them are in the Marib governorate. They are suffering from the attack, and also lack of the humanitarians and uh, lack of the vaccine vaccinations. Uh, because of the obstacles that's opposed by the by the Houthi militias. Well, thanks for the donors uh, for uh, for the generosity to support the humanitarian action plan. But uh, you know the root causes of this of this war need to be addressing by the political will and uh, the humanitarian just will. It's not a long term. 
uh, sustainable or not going long term for the war. But, uh, you know, it's taking uh, the conflicts, not in Yemen only, but in the regions and maybe in the world, uh, to addressing from the humanitarian perspective will take very long term, but will not have the outcome that we, we will need. So, my, with the question is, how can the civic engage or constructively on the peace building process and uh, to coordinate with the UN system in, in that manner? Uh, if there is some examples that will be, should be shared, we will appreciate. Uh, because as we mentioned that uh, it's uh, taking all the crisis into humanitarian, will not have an outcome, will not have a durable, a durable uh, as we said, is a durable solutions for the IDBs, for the humanitarian action plan. So uh, yeah, thank you for that, thanks. Thank you so much to Ahmed, uh, our colleague from the Yemen Permanent Mission here. Just looking at the room, if there are no additional questions, maybe what I suggest is that maybe for the first question we hand it back to Emily, and then maybe for the second I'll hand it over to you, and to Emily. I may just uh, simply read something that's in the chat uh, in uh, case for Joe. Um, people present in the room have not seen it. Uh, there is a point addressed to, to Joe uh, at UNAMA. Thanks uh, that you are tracking how Taliban are tracking and killing people from previous government. It will be important to have detailed data on what goes on after Taliban takeover. So I think the person is really commenting on how important uh, the continuation of the civilian casualty tracking mechanism is uh, in this context. Thank you so much, Beatrice. And maybe for our first question, Emily, can I hand it over to you? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great question. And I should say that, you know, when we first started this report, one of the things that we thought that we might do was compare the Ebola response to the COVID-19 response. But I think one of the things that we found so different in the case of COVID-19 is instead of having this sort of concerted international deployment to the front lines of disease control, Instead, there was sort of this drawing back of international presence. And I think, you know, that's that's for a number of reasons, but largely because, you know, each country was suffering. So it's much more difficult to sort of deploy a permanent mission to somewhere in particular. I don't know where you would choose, in fact, to deploy, you know, a COVID response mission, um, given that there are so many, you know, centers of centers of the crisis. And I think, you know, it's been a huge challenge from that perspective is that, you know, instead of having to think about civil military coordination on the ground in an Ebola context, instead we've had to deal with civil military cooperation um, when boots are no longer on the ground and people are trying to work remotely and not being able to interact with civilians. I would say that, you know, basically from, from a sort of a lessons learned perspective, if you look at the advantages uh, of being able to deploy a specific mission, and we looked at, you know, the cases of Ebola as well before we, before we wrote up this report, um, it's obviously, you know, a much e well, I say an easier task. It's an easier task in order to coordinate when you can put together these headquarters that are based on the ground. You can get together local militaries, international militaries, um, local humanitarian actors and healthcare actors all in one space and try and coordinate and, and come up with one plan. Um, but I think that in the case of COVID-19, this just it, it wouldn't have been possible and, and it continues to not be possible just because of the dispersed uh, nature of, of the virus. And I think, you know, it poses a really important challenge to us going forwards if we think about a global pandemic scenario for healthcare crises going forwards rather than a kind of an isolated or geographically distinct outbreak of something like Ebola or cholera in the future. You know, how do we adapt to that sort of challenge? Um, and I know that there were, you know, some important international uh, initiatives, things like, you know, a NATO um, headquarters tried to sort of do coordination on a more global scale to try and get, you know, donations of equipment um, from NATO member states coordinated and distributed out uh, on a global level. Um, but it's certainly a, a massive logistical, um, a logistical challenge to deal with a, you know, widespread uh, global outbreak. Um, so I think that's going to be something that, that we really need to, you know, to look at, I think, both as, you know, an international community, um, looking at our, you know, international organizations like NATO, like the UN, um, to see whether there's a more coordinated response that we can expect in the future that doesn't rely on us having, you know, the opportunity to deploy a specific mission to tackle a crisis if the next crisis is also going to be global. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a huge challenge and it's a really important point. Um, and I think it's going to be something that we're going to struggle with as we go on, especially if the next outbreak is also is also a global event. 
Um, just to touch really briefly on um, Hamid's question from, from Yemen, which I think is also really a really important one about this, you know, this tendency now to focus on the humanitarian and healthcare responses, um, perhaps over some of the, you know, broader political work that would otherwise be going on and the impact of COVID-19 on these kinds of broad political forums and peace forums has been huge. Um, trying to get people into a room to discuss at a high level um, conflict and, and peace, uh, peace processes has been a real challenge and not just for, for Yemen, also for Afghanistan in the past and other places like these big sort of international forums have been really restricted from what they can do because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that is going to be something that we just have to watch over the longer term. I know that we don't have enough data at the moment to say definitively that um, global funding for other initiatives is going to be cut due to funding that's now gone into the post or COVID-19 um, response um, response initiatives, but it is, I think, going to be have to be something that we we watch as an international community to make sure that we're still, you know, keeping a balance and that just because we have huge expenditure and, and a huge task ahead of us with COVID-19 doesn't mean that we let those other exceedingly important initiatives slip and that we find a way to do that, um, even if that's, you know, remotely over Zoom um, in the interim, um, because I would agree with you completely that both sides of that coin are really important. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the questions and I'll pass it back to you guys. Thank you so much, Emily. And I've noted that we have another question in the room. Quickly, if I can just hand it back to our colleague Joe in Afghanistan, because I know that he has to leave in a couple of minutes. So I'd just like to give him the opportunity to react to the comment we've received uh, on the importance of continuing this um, casualty uh, monitoring. Joe, do you want to quickly comment that? Sure, yeah, I think, uh, and it's a really important question and, and I appreciate it. And, and I'll just really quickly say, I mean, it, it really goes back to what I was saying about what we, under, you know, what we came to understand from the COVID pandemic and the way that we were able to interact with people. Um, it's now really coming to fruition for us in this time to see how difficult it is to reestablish those networks. So the, the, the short answer to the question, are we tracking uh, killings that are happening since 15 August. We're tracking those among many other human rights violations and abuses that are alleged. Do we have the ability to verify information the way that we, we did in the past? We do not at the moment. Uh, and, and, and again, I think, you know, that just comes back. doing our best to, to continue this work. And, and as I said, we're, we're encouraged by the fact that we've been able to start having direct engagement and advocacy already. And we do plan to raise these issues in that advocacy directly. Thanks. Thank you so much, Joe, for these additional comments. Going back to the room, we have another question, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm from the Permanent Nation of Armenia. First of all, thank you very much for organizing this event. It was very informative, very interesting. Uh, it was a privilege uh, to listen to the panelists. Uh, there is one question that interests me because in certain situations, I mean, people, mm, uh, civilians who suffer from, uh, suffer from conflicts, sometimes there is a situation when there is a uh, hindrance to the access to the area. And in such cases, I mean, these people are in fact left alone. And I just want to understand what international community um, I mean international organizations or international non-governmental organizations can do to help these people because I mean there are two options I believe I mean either you leave them behind just ignore their uh, needs uh, or their humanitarian assistance or you act uh, so I just want to understand what should we should be done I mean if we choose to act which is I believe moral, and then how should it be done? Uh, you, thank you very much. I feel that Beatrice has <laughs> an answer to that question. Am I mistaken? 
Sorry, thank you so much. That's a great question. I just wanted to maybe take the opportunity of this question to link it, I think, we, to, to one of our colleagues from Ukraine who is on the line, uh, because that's one of the situations that they have been facing, people being isolated in settlements in the grey zone in, in Donbass and with uh, no access to uh, either vaccination or healthcare during COVID because that bridge would not be accessible to cross that would you know uh, allow them to actually access the facility so i think um your question was geared at what we can do as international community but i think what uh, Suleiman will, will highlight is also what local solutions have been developed between civilians and militaries uh, to that end so if that's okay for you Anne, uh, maybe we can uh hand over to, to Suleiman Mamutov, in, in, who is speaking from Ukraine. Um, Suleiman, maybe for one or two minutes, can you, can you just let us know about this, uh, this point that speaks directly to, to the question of Eric here in the room? Uh, sure, Beatrice. Uh, thank you for giving the floor. I'm a member of a civic Ukraine team. And uh, I'd like, first of all, to thank my colleagues and everyone who contributed their time and effort to make this comprehensive and very practical report research uh, I think, uh, yeah, that for Ukraine, there was a case uh, at the beginning of the pandemic when uh, civilians reported to our field teams that security forces deployed in the conflict affected area did not consistently adhere to COVID-19 restriction measures. And we have helped communities raise concerns with the local security forces. As a result of a dialogue, all sides improved compliance with the restriction measures. We also quickly adjusted our training program on the protection of civilians for the military, which we continue to conduct online even during the pandemic. And the report effectively like, shows uh, that incorporating new situations to the, to the training for the military, the developments that unfolded due to the COVID-19, it can immediately help address risk factors for civilian harm. And the other case, as you correctly mentioned, concerned the situation faced by a village community in the gray zone. It is an area outside the territory controlled by the government. So there is a bridge link that linking the village with the government controlled areas uh, that was the community's only access to shops, to food and markets. And to contain the rapid spread of the virus in this area, the armed forces of Ukraine ordered to stop the movement over the bridge, uh, which made vulnerable communities uh, very, like they were stuck in the, in, in the gray zone. And the local civic officer took an initiative uh, on civil military cooperation officer. She um, took an initiative to find a solution uh, that would not contradict the movement over the bridge uh, uh, and, and also at the same time uh, would allow civilians access uh, to crucial supplies. After she reached out to our team, we helped her consult a wide range of international organizations in the area. And uh, she also contacted the uh, armed forces higher command. Uh, and uh, as a conclusion, uh, we, we, we decided that uh, improving the sanitary measures on the bridge could, could be a solution. And international organization offered a set, like to set up a sanitation checkpoints as uh, at those time, the masks and sanitizers were in shortage. And uh, as a result, movement over the bridge was reopened with sanitation and identity checks, which allowed civilians to regain uh, access to food and uh, assistance. And I think that the value uh, of this report is multiplied as, is, as it shows not only the concrete cases from different countries, but also gives the refined factors of, su of success, these innovative experiences that can also be applied in other contexts. Thank you so much for this intervention. And we have another question that came through the chat. I think that's, that one is for you, Beatrice. Um, COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the scale of mental health difficulties among the people. I wonder if Civic um, or any of your partner organization works to extend mental health services to the civilians living in fragile states or conflict zones. Thank you. Um, thank you. Really quickly, because I think we are running out of time. Um, we, 
So at Civic, we don't have specific mental health activities, but definitely uh, when we look at the types of harm that civilians are uh, facing uh, in different contexts, the, the psychological harm is something that, that comes out uh, strongly. For instance, we were discussing just now Ukraine. Uh, we've been looking at how the hybrid activities, including manipul of manipulation of information and other hybrid tactics, uh, do have an impact on civilians and mainly in terms of psychological harm. So it's a challenge then to be able to measure it and measure the, the connection, uh, but it definitely came out from, from the research. So at Civic, we're not delivering uh, mental health uh, support. We're not a medical organization, but definitely a lot of organizations do um, in this sector, and uh, including local actors. So we are therefore very regular in contact. Thank you so much, Beatrice. I think we would uh, startly move to closing and end. I'm just checking with Maxence because I saw that somebody put their camera on. Does it mean that we have la was one last question? Is that the case, Maxence? Checking to you? No. I think it's all good then. I think I really want to thank everybody for their very active engagement. We've had, I think, a very rich conversation. Thank you so much also for our panelists and for their contribution. I do not think, Beatrice, I want to try to resume such an incredible and, and captivating conversation, but I think maybe a, a couple of very, very quick comments uh, on, on my side. I do think that what came out of this conversation, and it came out quite strongly throughout all the inter uh, uh, intervention that we had, is the importance of harnessing those locally-led uh, solutions, how much it's important to invest in the communities. Because indeed, when we are faced with severe access constraints, we do have a very trustworthy uh, partner that we can work with. And so how much it's really important to invest uh, in these community-based approaches. And I think one also element that struck me in the conversation is the, I know it's a buzzword, but I think it's quite impressive. It's an incredible resilience, actually, that the organization have to try indeed to still be there for the people in need of protection, what kind of agile solutions we manage to develop when we are faced with such a crisis as, as a pandemic. I think that was also an interesting thread that we heard throughout those uh, different comments. As Emily pointed out, and I hope you agree, I think Beatrice, this is very much the beginning of the conversation. I think we have incredible, valuable recommendations coming out of the policy brief. We hope that we can have follow-up conversations on how we're moving forward on the implementation of those recommendations. You know, you can always count on Switzerland support if you want to uh, if you want support on facilitating those conversations moving forward. Um, once again, thank you so much to our colleagues uh, in the room, to our distinguished panelists, to the wonderful crew uh, there uh, who supported the organization of this event. Beatrice, of course, over to you if there are some last elements that you want to highlight before we close this event. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, sorry that we went uh, beyond time, but it was so interesting. I would like to really thank uh, um, from the bottom of my heart, our panelists, our speakers, uh, everybody who has contributed because it was extremely interesting. I've been working on this topic since a few months now and I've learned so much actually from listening to all of you. Um, so really looking forward to continuing this conversation. And, and now that we have um, identified good practices, the question is going to be disseminating them and institutionalizing them uh, going forward, which is still a big, big chunk of work. Thank you very much. <laughs>